Hello, my name is Ran, and this is the Flow Artist Podcast. Every episode, we interview inspiring movers, thinkers, and teachers on how they find their flow and much, much more. We speak with some of the best yoga, movement, and meditation teachers from Australia and all around the world. Speaking of all around the world, our episode today features a recorded conversation between myself, co-host Joe Stewart, and Jay Brown. Jay Brown is a yoga teacher, writer, and the host of Jay Brown's Yoga Talks. He's currently based in Pennsylvania after relocating from the studio he ran in Brooklyn, New York City for many, many years. He's a prolific blogger and writer, having contributed to sites such as Yoga Dork and Elephant Journal, writing many informative articles over the years on the state of yoga. His podcast is one of my must-listens, and he's featured some of the world's most well-known yoga teachers in very in-depth and informative conversations. His podcast is a huge influence on myself, and probably one of the reasons this podcast exists. So it's your fault, Jay. Jay will be visiting Sydney in the beginning of December, and he won't be in Melbourne that time round, but... I understand he will be back in Sydney and Melbourne early next year. So that's pretty exciting. I hope that I get the chance to meet him in person. So look out for that one. Now, before we start with the conversation, I just want to tell you about an event hosted by former guest and forever friend of the podcast, Asher David Packman. Asher is hosting an event, Blood Bath for Blood Cancer Awareness Month. This is an event to help raise money for those in need, their caregivers, friends and families. If you've heard our episode with Asher, you would know that he has been coping very well with blood cancer for some time and that he is also a certified Wim Hof Method instructor. So this event that's held at Elwood Sailing Club on Sunday, September the 23rd will incorporate breathwork, meditation and an ice bath. Brr. It will be an amazing event. If I wasn't already going to another workshop, I would be there myself. So I'll leave a link to that in the show notes. All right, that is more than enough from me. Let's get into this conversation with Jay. I grew up in Los Angeles and I moved from Los Angeles to New York uh, to go to college. I went to NYU to study acting originally, but oh, things didn't go according to plan. (laughs) (laughs) I, um, you know, my mom had passed away when I was 16. Mm -hmm. She had leukemia and, you know, that was very unresolved in me. And when I got into acting training, it all kind of came out. And then, you know, that ended up I don't know, dis- ultimately I, I finished my acting degree, but by the time I was done with that, I didn't want to be an actor anymore. Was and, it one of those, oh, sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead. What were you going to say? Was it one of those like strip you back, tear you open kind of acting courses? Yes. You know a little bit about acting training and, you know, I had not allowed myself to feel all the emotion of my mom's passing. And, you know, I had like a deathbed experience with her and it all, I was like 16 and starring in the school play. And, and then when I went to acting training, as you suggested, it's all about breaking you down so you can like be available emotionally. And I like went full bore into that. Like I remember my freshman year of college, I did like this final performance piece where I, I got naked on stage and like projected home super eight movies of my mom holding me as a child on my chest. And I was like completely ripping open all the wounds and stuff. But ultimately acting training does a very good job of like breaking you down, but it, it didn't do anything to build me up. Like it just left me like a wreck on the floor. Yeah. That's so tough to have to deal with. Like, especially when you're at that young age and, well, I think ultimately, I mean, it was tough, but it it was good. Like, there's that expression, you have to feel it to heal it. Yeah, yeah. So I wasn't feeling anything. And I needed to be able to feel if I wanted to be an actor. I guess that's why they do that. But ultimately, for me, you know, originally, 
it was hard and it did take me in a very dark direction. Like I went down a downward spiral and ultimately got to a place where I felt like either I'm going to kill myself or I got to find another, another way to live. And so but, was, was yoga that other path? It was, I mean, I would say that, you know, it wasn't just yoga classes though. I mentioned this deathbed experience I had with my mom and there was, there was a, a moment in this experience that is unexplainable to me where I made a promise to my mom. I told her that I was going to do great things and make her proud. And, you know, at 16, I don't even know where that came out. I don't even know where that came from, you know, yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. but when I, when I was at this point where it was like, maybe I want to end my life. All I could think of was this promise I made to her. So yeah. I really, I, I think of that promise as the heart of my yoga and like that's ultimately what did bring me because when I was in college part of the acting program was like yoga classes as a movement component so I had taken these classes and even when I was really like at my worst I I could acknowledge to myself that doing a yoga practice would make me feel better on some level so timely that that came into your life at that time when you just would need that bit of breathing space and that bit of perspective when you're kind of like unpacking and opening everything up again. I think that's often how it happens. Yeah, you know, that yeah. to like when the student's ready, the teacher appears. I, mean, I, I really think that there's those kind of synchronicities in life. And I don't know, for whatever reason, yes, I was fortunate enough to have that influence. It was one of two. I remember my friend when I was really at that place, she said, well, what do you want to do? What do you, what makes you feel joy in life? And I, I could only identify two things, which was playing my electric bass guitar and going to a yoga class. So she said, well, I think you should do those two things every day. Oh, well, good advice. <laughs> Straight up. I thought, <laughs> yes, that's a really good idea. So I just started doing that. I started going to yoga classes every day. And at first it was at uh, Jiva Mukti Yoga Center on 2nd mm -hmm. Avenue. Must have been 1993 or 94. And at that time, it was a really different landscape. Like there was no formal Jiva Mukti method. Uh, it was just this like center in the East Village that had this really eclectic mix of all these teachers in different traditions. Wow. So I got, uh, yeah, I got exposed to, they were a mix, you know, Sharon and David, they first did Shiva Nanda training. Then they studied with Mr. Yungar and then they met Mr. Patavi Joyce and they really combined those things. And I remember when they did their first teacher training, which was for free. And then they did, their second one was when they charged. And, and that was when they decided that it was going to be like a method. And the teachers were asked that if they wanted to teach there, they'd have to go through the training. And, and a number of them left, and I followed one of them. So it was a bit of a turning point. It really was. It was a moment when, and it was not just Jiva Mukti. It was like all over where, like, the, the generation before me had gone to India and, like, met the gurus and had come back and opened their centers. And then there was my generation. And then we didn't, I didn't know the gurus, but their pictures were up on the altars, opened these centers and, and ultimately developed these training programs, which is, it was like, I remember Jiva Mukti created their thing before the 200 hour standard though. There was like a whole year long program and it wasn't about hours, but at that point, everything started to kind of codify, you know, and it started to kind of come into the culture in a totally different way. Like when I first started, it was this total counterculture move, you know? And so did it also corresponded with becoming a bit more commercial? Exactly. Like, I mean, it, it was over some time, but yes, like I remember when like I showed up shortly after Patabi Joyce had really kind of done a tour around and hit the scene and that approach, the Ashtanga Vinyasa approach, because it was so much more physical, like it was, it made you sweat and it was like faster and it was more aerobic. So it became the way that yoga was embraced by the fitness folks. Like there was no yoga classes in the gym and then Ashtanga hit and like all the gyms started having classes. 
And so was that your initial practice? Like that's when you first really got into a regular practice? <clears throat> like quite yes. an intense physical practice? Well, like I said, Jeevan Mukti was a mix. So I, I, I studied at Jeevan Mukti for good almost two years in total. And I got exposed to a bunch of different things. And then initially I gravitated towards that Ashtanga influence because I, I was in my you know early 20s and I was messed up and you know. It's like I discovered that if you if you think there's something wrong with you, if you think you're like broken in some way, which I did, torturing your body makes perfect sense. It, just, it just seems like the right thing to do. Yeah, like it's um, a path for transformation. Yeah, I just I felt like I needed to transcend this difficulty or I needed to like purify myself. And I think that, you know, that approach just and I was young and I was physically capable. I had like a lot of good natural physical ability so I could do stuff. And you know, I, I just got into it and did it quite religiously and then ultimately hurt myself. I like blew out my knee working on poses from a third series in a very reckless manner. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I didn't have a formal, formal stronger teacher. Like I studied with a woman named Allison West who had studied with Patabi Joyce and she was super smart. So I was kind of learning it in a more roundabout way. You know, I like wasn't in the community, but I was learning the system. Um, some people might say that's why I hurt myself. I don't know. I think I just hurt myself because I was trying to do ridiculous things with my body, <laughs> you know? And, and I remember at that time I asked teachers, like, why did this happen and what should I do about it? And the stock answer I got was, uh, you need to have better alignment. That, that, that the mm-hmm. reason that I got hurt was that I didn't have proper alignment. And what so does that even mean? I know. Believe me. I, <laughs> it took me a long time to come to what you just said. But at that time, there was still and, – and, you know, I got a podcast coming up with Lauren Fishman uh, in a couple of weeks. And this is what we talked about. There is still, in some people's minds, an idea of, like, optimal alignment like a right alignment like one instruction that's just going to work for everyone like like look at the picture of mr yungar in line on yoga and that's the way it's supposed to be uh and so you know i went and learned some my yungar alignment and you know like i said i could do stuff so i could execute level four alignment to the praise of my teachers but still like had massive amounts of pain and was deeply unresolved and disillusioned in myself still over my mom. Like I was better. I had discipline and I wasn't like, and I was like doing yoga and I was like in certain regards much better, but I, at the same time, I still was not well. And, you know, frankly, there was really, in my opinion, a very fundamental flaw in what I was doing in my yoga practice. And I I really remember the moment when it was clear. I I tell the story often, but it's so encapsulated it for me where there was this point I had all these like really flashy things that were part of my regular practice. One of them was like a handstand press. Mm -hmm. And so uh, my teachers or not my teachers, but the teachers at the centers that I would take classes at sometimes would, they would know that about me. So they would ask me to do demonstrations. So like when everybody goes to the wall to do their handstand, I would do mine in the center of the room and the teacher would say, Oh, Jay, will you demonstrate for us? I'd say, sure. And then I do like, I did my big handstand press one day and I came down and everybody in class applauded. And the teacher said, this is what you're working towards. And like right then in that moment, I was feeling like all good about myself because I was the only one who could do that. Mm. And I was being, you know, praised for it. But on the way home, I was just miserable because like I said, I had all this pain and I was really like, not doing great, <laughs> but uh, I could yeah. do I could do the handstand press. Right, and everybody, handstanding, but um, everything else yeah, is falling apart. Was, was screwed up, yeah. And then, so they, you know, I just thought to myself, "Crap! If this is what we're working towards, we're screwed." You know, there's got to be more to it. There's got to be more to it than being able to like do a freaking handstand. And so I've got a question for you. Like now, you're so known for like the gentle is the new advanced approach, and that practice is so much more than doing feats of physical strength with your body. 
And like you've just kind of explained your journey through injury and through pain to get there. I'm curious, what do you think, like if beginner young punk Jay rocked up to one of your classes today, how do you think he would have found it? It's a good question. I mean, I don't know. Honestly, part of me thinks I would have thought it was lame. (laughs) 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 This shit is slow and, uh, you know, boring. I don't know if I'd have been into it. I, I don't know. At the same time, I'd like to think I might have been able to save me some trouble. Yeah, yeah. And, like, there must be at the heart of what you do now, like, that spark of what first drew you to yoga. Like, it's just been distilled down and you've kind of stripped away some of that extraneous stuff that's maybe not so good for the body and kind of really refined your way down to the heart of what really helped you from those first sessions. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that's it. Although, you know, what the essence of it wasn't the first sessions. I think the first sessions were just, like, seeds planted. Yeah. Like, oh, it's possible for you to be better or for you to not feel bad, I guess is a better way to put it. (laughs) I mean, for me, at some point when I became disillusioned with yoga, I did take this trip to India and I I met a Swami there. And that Swami was, I think, the person who really turned it around for me because he was unimpressed by my displays of physical prowess. Like all the things in New York that made me advanced he compared to being like a child. Mm -hmm. And so instead he had me do really ridiculously simple things like wrist rotations and stuff, which to me at the time were exactly what I thought they were, they were boring. I was like, I'm like this 20 something year old power yoga guy and you're having me rotate my wrist. And I was like, this isn't even like a warm up. This is like a waste of my time, you know? Mm -hmm. But after every little thing that we would do, he would make me sit. And then he would ask me this question. He would say, how do you feel? And for like a couple of days, like I would ramble on never answering the question. You know, like I would talk about the range of motion in my wrist and I would like observe all these like alignment things. And I would like try to impress him with all of my being a yoga teacher. And he was just getting really annoyed by that. (laughs) (laughs) And then Finally, one day, like, I started to think maybe this guy was, like, a fraud and I was wasting my time. And so he, he asked me, how do you feel? And I kind of snapped a little bit and I said, I don't know how I feel. And he smiled really big, you know, and he said, good. And he, like, it got, became really clear to me that, like, I had learned all of this stuff about yoga, like, alignment and I could chant a Gayatri mantra and, like, I filled my head with all this stuff but I had no idea how I felt. Not really. And he, and no one had asked me that, you know, I'd studied Mm. with some pretty renowned teachers and he ultimately, he really, he turned me on to what I understand now to be a totally tantric viewpoint of yoga. Like when I got to India, I had this idea that I was going to climb the eight limbs. You know, I was going to do my asana, do my pranayama and my meditation. And then I was going to get to the samadhi which meant I wasn't going to have all this pain in me. Mm-hmm. Oh, you're just going to tick all the boxes off and that would be your Yeah, I'm, just gonna, I'm going to do it. I'm a achiever. I'm motivated. I'm going to make it happen, you know? And it wasn't happening. <laughs> <laughs> I could do a handstand. And he was like of this viewpoint. He would say, oh, you need to do a little something. You do a little something. And it was this tantric view where it isn't this linear progression. Like you're trying to get somewhere. Like you're not there or you try to become something because you're not already whole or already in union and you got to get there. And he was sort of presenting this tantric viewpoint as like, no, 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 you know, you are already a whole being. We can just do some things to ease these troubles in you. (laughs) And, and, and it was much more about integration about like not having a blissful experience while I'm in seated meditation with myself but having a blissful experience when I'm like having dinner with somebody, you know, like (laughs) it was like, he, he took me to get pizza in India, Mm -hmm. which was crazy. Like there's no pizza in India, but he knew I was from New York and he knew in New York we ate pizza. So he took me to get pizza. Like he was sort of through gesture communicating to me like this different idea about yoga. So to your question about the young me, I think that, I could appeal to the young me with that. I think I would have been very open to this idea 
of a non-dual understanding of life if it had been presented to me earlier. And so I, I do think that the, the gentler approach is, it's partly about treating your body with more nurturing love, <laughs> but it's also about um, an understanding or like a mindset about life for me. Like there's, I had a conversation recently with Richard Miller, who's like the founder of iRest and he's this like yogic scholar as well. And he was, he was making a connection, which I really loved between um, really simple, simple breathing and moving exercises that are not a big challenge on your body and like non-dual understanding. And I, I think there's something to that when you focus your attention in on just these very simple fundamental facts of your breathing and your body happening as a phenomena, very often that can point your experience to what I think is kind of at the center of things. And it's so interesting, isn't it, that we need to be reminded to be kind to ourselves and to just <laughs> pay attention to what's happening in our bodies and how it's making us feel, even yogis. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, honestly, I think sometimes it's, it's, not, it's not just that we need to be reminded, like we actually need to learn how. Yeah, not everybody had a person in their life who was an example of that. Um, I mean, like my folks were really g good people and they loved me, but I don't know, they just came from a different generation. They weren't in, they weren't in touch with what they were feeling and thinking so much, you know, to me, it was first learning what that even is. And frankly, why I'm, I'm so kind of passionate about these conversations about the yoga world is that, I also then developed all these very unhealthy patterns through yoga practice, you know, pushing my body that hard or this idea that if I can do more with my body, I will get farther. It's been a lot of work to undo those patterns, like to not, not feel like I need to fix my body, <laughs> but to, to think of my body more as like a, like a plant that I tend to or something, you know, mm. that to me is like my biggest challenge in practice these days is to really genuinely be kind to myself, to really treat myself with care in the doing of whatever practices I do. Mm, I think sometimes as teachers as well, even in feeling like we're taking care of ourselves, sometimes we just overlay more things that we should be doing. <laughs> When sometimes That's what we right. need to do is rest. Because <laughs> yeah, yes. we have all these practices yeah. at our disposal. <laughs> That's right. You can always tell that when like you're you're like mad at yourself or you feel guilty, right? I didn't do it. I didn't eat right. Or I did you know, like you, you lay more on you, like you said. Uh, so I don't know. For me it is when I say um, take care of myself, I mean like a very unconditional like loving. Mm hmm. And I guess it's that, like your guru in India had said, that actual tuning in, like, what do I really feel? What's mm -hmm. actually happening here? Not, what do I think I should be feeling after this mm -hmm. practice? And yes. And you know what I would say even more importantly for me was that where that information is going to come from is inside me. So I almost felt like I mentioned like my teachers and the generation before me, they went to India and found gurus. And I think somewhere in the back of my mind, I thought, hey, maybe when I go to India, I'll find a guru. But I met this Swami who was like a Tantra guy who basically lived up in a cave the whole year, except for the rainy season and would come down to teach during rainy season. So I basically felt like I had gone to India. I had met a Swami, a Swami who lived in a cave and he told me that I get to decide. Mm hmm. <laughs> like so I sort of like I had like the India pass <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> to, to, like, to like break rules you know like I had learned all the rules and the way things you were supposed to do but now I was just practicing by myself at home and I just had this like if I can't find a good reason for it I'm not going to do it anymore and I felt like I had permission to make my own determinations about things and to me that was like the real gift you know because these days when a lot of these uh, guru systems are falling apart because it's learned that the guru was a sexual abuser his entire, his entire career, people whose, 
whose connection to it is the person are in a really sticky place, you know. But if if your connection to it is coming from some inward inquiry in you that's not contingent on anybody else, then you, at least you're in a place to process what's going on, you know. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, I've been having conversations and and seeing what's been going on, and it's it's crazy. It's not just in the yoga world; it's in the Buddhist community. So that Swami really was the person who helped me like develop my own tantra, my own ability to feel that I could derive direction from within me. And so I know that um, I've heard you talk about on your podcast that you tend to teach a really similar sequence in each of your classes. Mm -hmm. How do you, like in your teaching, give people that gentle guidance to find their own practice within that same flow of poses? Is that something that you kind of articulate or is it kind of loose enough that people find their way well i mean the choice to have a set sequence is so that i can individualize yeah because for a long time i I always came up with new sequences and in in new york for a long time i don't know if it's still the same maybe in some circles it is you know you were judged on how good a teacher you were by your ability to sequence like, can you come up with new and different combinations of things? Almost basically like being a choreographer. Mm. And I was pretty good at that. I, can't, I could come up with stuff. Uh, but I remember there was like this one time where I had come up with this sequence the night before that I just thought was so brilliant. And then I got there the next morning and there was like maybe eight people and only like, I don't know, maybe two or three of the people could actually do what I had planned. And all the rest of the folks who were there was just, it was like nowhere in their wheelhouse. It was way too hard, you know, but I didn't have any other plan. Like I didn't know what else to do. So I just taught this sequence to the two people who could do it. And then like was as encouraging as I could to everybody else while they struggled along through. And it just was like really clear to me. It was like, that's, that's about me. That's about my ability to sequence it's not about anybody in the room's ability to learn something. So I just decided to take off my coming up with stuff. And it's an ongoing debate. Like some people believe like if you come up with the right sequence, then you'll, you'll be more effective. Like that's what makes you a yoga therapist because you're more trained so you can come up with the right sequence. And I just don't believe that. I actually don't think it matters. I think on some level, it doesn't matter what poses you do. <laughs> it really doesn't. So I, I came up with a set sequence, which is not, it's not um, strict. Like I'm allowed to go off of it and you're allowed to go off of it. You know? It's not in any way like a dogma. Mm-hmm. It, it's, it's, it's a set of really simple forms that, you know, are largely drawing off the TKV Desikachar tradition, but I'm applying it to this group vinyasa yoga class setting because I, I was teaching in New York. And when I tried to do the really, really traditional version, that people weren't into it. Mm-hmm. You know? So I had to find a way to take the principles and put them into like a format that was more meeting the expectation of people. So I have this set, simple vinyasa sequence. But what happens is, is if people come, one, it's pretty simple, so it's not hard to follow. Mm -hmm. And two, once someone comes for a bit, they learn it and then they know it. And then they're not focused on what's going to come next in the sequence. And then I can go around and actually work with people individually the same way I would if I was seeing them one-to-one. Like I can get around and give people individual things or help them find their uh, way to do this form because just because I'm going to have everybody do the same poses in the same order doesn't mean they're going to do the same. Mm, Yeah. And I think because I have that sensibility as a teacher and because I have the simple slower paced program that has lots of room for people to make changes, I'm able to do that to a large degree. I'm able to, allow for people to develop their own idiosyncratic. Yeah, their own practice, (laughs) Uh, I guess. Yeah, yeah, that's the idea, you know. And I I do think that doing self-practice by yourself at home or having a one-to-one practice with the teacher is like 
kind of by far the best, but you know, this convention of group yoga classes is like standard now. I mean, I always start workshops and I ask people, have you ever had any private yoga instruction? And almost never does anybody raise their hand. Mm. So I just thought, well, if we're going to learn yoga in the ways that, that I came to, it's going to have to be in group classes because that's what people are doing and what people can afford. So again, to your question, I do think it's possible to um, individualize practice in a group and having a simple program that can, people can learn and then together we can develop their individual changes or modifications or sometimes even choices. Like some people come to my class and then they, they don't do sections of it and they, they have something else that we came up with that they do at that section. And because everyone knows what they're doing, it's not like a massive disruption. Everyone can just kind of flow at their own pace and do their own thing in a way that works for them. That's right. But it is still a structured class. So it's not like a total free form somatic mm. movement session. You know, it is a structured class, but it, it allows for people to um, make their own choices and work with me to do that. And to find the version of this program that I'm teaching that's right for them. And so this seems like really like personal connection. And I'm really interested to see how you are able to convey this sense of connection rather than performance when you go out of that in-person setting and teach online. Hmm. Well, me and you both. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's really... I mean, I resisted it for a long time, but it is the way that the world has gone, you know, on so many, in so many ways. So I, I have embraced it and I have a, a producer and partner named Josh Citron who I work with. And, you know, we're really trying to find like, how can we embrace these technologies in ways that we feel good about? Because yeah. there's ways to embrace them that are like exploitive and crappy and then there's ways where they're not, you know, like starting the podcast was one of them because I had a blog for many, many years, over 10 years. I've been writing 800 words every month. And I, I watched it. Initially, there was a whole blogosphere, like a WordPress blogosphere. And then everything went to Facebook. And then it all went to kind of crap. It was like, I got all trolly. Mm -hmm. And you no longer were having like these constructive dialogues in the comment threads, you know. And so the internet really changed. Mm. And so for me, podcasting, it's like, it's like old radio, you know? It's the, the way where we, we, like I said at the beginning, it's, you can't clickbait an hour-long nuanced conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so to me, you doing the podcast was one of those ways to kind of uh, use the internet in ways that... Um, I found more connecting and more made me feel like a human. Mm. Uh, and great. the video stuff, well, let me say something else because the yeah, video yeah. stuff is a whole other world because I, I started this live stream subscription where basically I created like my own closed circuit TV channel, which you can do now with the technology mm. where you have an embedded thing on a password protected page so only the people you give the password to can see it. And then I basically set a laptop in the back of the room and just started like live streaming all of my public classes. And I have a, a mic on me, so it's closed mic. And, you know, at first I felt really weird about it. You know, <laughs> I was like, man, this is weird, you know. And ultimately over as time has gone on and people have used it and they email me, and sometimes it's people I've met who no longer live where I live. It's actually really turned into an amazing thing. I've got a studio now where I, I have more control over the internet and stuff. And I have control over the lighting so it looks better. And then if, and I, I created a login page so I know when people are there. Mm -hmm. So I can actually talk to people in other places in the world, even though I can't see them always. And it's been really powerful. People have been having good practices. <laughs> and ultimately, I started this new teacher's class, which is sort of the next level where it's, it's an actual like face-to-face -face, uh, Zoom group call where I'm, I'm doing like 
basically like, I don't know, it's kind of mentoring or just, it's like a teacher's circle. And we like talk about stuff that we're dealing with and like all the stuff that people really want to be able to talk about, but they don't feel like they have anybody to talk about with. Mm -hmm. So it's a sangha. It is. It is absolutely a sangha. And, and it's online and, you know, it's been really, I've been doing it for like a month and a half now and it's been so rewarding and wonderful. And frankly, at this point, like I'm making more money off of live streaming my classes than I do off the actual class. Mm-hmm. So I, I've, I've had to embrace it. My, my producer has got this idea. He's like, we could get a really big screen and put it up <laughs> on the wall and you can see everybody. And, it, and all I keep thinking of is Black Mirror. And I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> it's, it's the apocalypse. But, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm trying to ride the line of it. And, and I do think there are ways to to use it. I, I, I've been feeling pretty good about the video stuff that I've been doing, but it, it is also strange. Like every minute of my teaching for the last year has been documented. Oh yeah. It's really strange. You know, I spent 20 years teaching into the ether, but now it's all on video. <laughs> do you ever watch it back? I do. Sometimes at first I watched it back and I like learn things, you know, it's like a mirror. You notice your habits and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so that was actually constructive. But now I don't. I don't. I think I'm confident in what I'm doing as a teacher at this point. So I don't I don't need it in the same way that I did. And I I don't watch it back so much. And sometimes when I do, I like it. I'm like, oh, that was good. (laughs) (laughs) That worked out. All right. Look at how nice it went right up for them. You know, like they really got it, you know. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm okay with it now, but it took a while for sure. I was, I was weird about it to start for sure. I mean, I really like the way that with the podcast and with your live streaming, it's kind of like a real be the change that you want to see in the world because you kind of saw the slightly toxic atmosphere of a lot of the yoga discourse online and how commercial a lot of yoga imagery was and really took it back to something that's about talking something that's about feeling something that's about sharing and as a consequence it's actually made your own teaching more sustainable because you can relax a little bit about money if you know what you're doing is really resonating with people I think that's right I think I am trying to walk my talk and I did have a yoga center for 10 years I hired you know 15 teachers and and managed 42 classes a week and followed the lead of those who came before me. And then ultimately, you know, core power opened up in the neighborhood and moto opened up and the neighborhood got gentrified and I couldn't compete anymore. And now I have an artist loft space with a bathroom down the hall. That's kind of (laughs) scuzzy. And on the desk, when you walk in there is just a cigar box with change and a, a, a sign in sheet and a sign that says, choose your rate, $10, $15, or $20. And I, I'm actually making more money when people show up to those classes. Not that I just started them, so I haven't had many people coming yet. But when people come, I end up making more money than I was at the centers that I was teaching at. So to me, to your point, one, it is definitely about creating and the, the conversation that I'd like to hear. Like the first blog post I ever wrote over 10 years ago was like kind of railing against a yoga journal article. Cause I had seen this yoga journal article and I just thought this is full. And I just thought, where is anybody having a real conversation about yoga? Not in yoga journal. Mm-hmm. So I started, I said, instead of just bashing yoga journal, you have to like write what you, what you would like to read. You know, like what do you, what do you, if you think the conversation should be different, tell me what the conversation is. Mm, yeah. So I definitely uh, started there. And then as it's gone on and, you know, I talk about this on the podcast a lot. I came into yoga in my early twenties before it was mainstream. Now I'm in my mid forties and I have two kids and it's like totally mainstream. And we got Instagram yoga and like my coming into my adulthood is completely interwoven with this, the the yoga world's progression. So 
as the yoga world is now kind of struggling to find out what's coming next now that the guru systems are falling and now that we've got um, scaled models of yoga centers that are VC backed that mm -hmm. independent players can't really compete with so much. Where's it going? And, you know, for me, to your point, I, I am trying to like practice what I preach and I do feel like there's a bit of like a return mm -hmm. <laughs> to some earlier days before we all, before there were commercials with people doing yoga for McDonald's, you know? And I, I don't think it's like, you can never go back in time. Like we, we were returning to some things that we moved away from. Like I, like I point to my loft space as an example but it's with new eyes, you know, mm. now we, I have a live stream subscription. <laughs> there was no live stream subscriptions, you know, 15 years ago, which isn't that long ago. And so you've kind of like just described that whole wave of like yoga coming into the mainstream and kind of becoming commercial and almost like that wave started to break a bit. Do you think that there's like an online wave starting now? Like this is the kind of beginning of a whole different direction of how yoga teachers are going to teach in the future? Like, do you kind of, what do you think that, say, a yoga teacher 20 years from now is going to look like? Well, I actually think that a yoga teacher 20 years from now is going to be exactly the same as a yoga teacher <laughs> now, or is exactly the same as they were, like, 2,000 to 5,000 years ago. I, I, I kind of feel like yoga is fine. We're not mm. going to mess it up, even with our technology. Um, but I do appreciate your question because I do think that even in the time that I've been a yoga teacher in 20 years there's been a massive shift so I think it will look different <laughs> 20 <laughs> years from now and I do think it is how we're going to relate to technologies a lot of the time is going to be it like I've been experimenting with the ways that the technology will work for yoga is when they facilitate the connections you know because there's, like I said, there's ways to use these technologies where they, they separate us or ways to use it where they don't. And, and I'll give you an example. Like I have a DVD and downloads and an online workshop that are recorded. And they're from a few years ago. And they're up there. And in certain ways, like, I don't know, that's less work and you can make more money off of it. Like to just shoot something and put it up there and then it's just there. But to have it be more interactive <clears throat> and have it be more live. It continues to breathe and move. It, it's not so fixed in space, you know, fixed mm -hmm. in time. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think that, you know, yoga teachers are going to continue to evolve with the way that our societies are evolving. We're, we're, we're expressive of what's happening in our cultures a lot of times. And then there's these universal threads that I think also cut through that. And so this might be a really hard to answer question because I think one of the reasons why people really resonate with what you do is you have a really authentic voice. Like you can tell that you're really speaking from your heart and teaching from your heart. Do you have any advice for newer teachers who maybe do want to take their offerings online and just a feeling self-conscious or kind of struggling to find that voice when you don't have the room of people to directly connect to. Yeah. I don't know. I was just having this conversation in my teacher's class this week. Um, <clears throat> and I just, I don't know. Part of me feels like, I don't know if it's a great idea to start videoing yourself or live streaming yourself until you feel like you've got your feet underneath you and you're really confident. Yeah, I think that's good advice, actually. Yeah, I mean, I just, I spent over 10 years you know, writing 800 words a month, which was a practice for me, but ultimately did create some kind of a, a small scale online platform where people know me from online. And it, it takes time. It's not like you just post one blog. Like, I can't tell you how many times I've I had somebody send me a blog post like, I'm going to start a blog. I'm so inspired by your <laughs> blog. And I'm like, fantastic. And I will totally like give them feedback. I'm like, this is great, you know, and I'll try to be a, a friend. And then they never write another one. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like they just, there was just they had one in them, you know. 
So I do think, especially if you're a new teacher, your, your first order of business is to really continue to develop your practice in your teaching. You got to, mm. you got to be able to back it up. You know, you got to have a thing at some point for me, I felt like my teaching had become a clear thing that I knew what it was. Like I knew what I was doing as a teacher and I could see that it, it had some signature things to it that other people didn't do that, that were specific to me and my personality and my expression. And, you know, to your question about having an authentic voice, I attribute that to something. Um, I had a, a good friend, my best friend on the planet still to this day, who was one of my very first yoga students. And he knew me from before I was a yoga teacher. So I had to find this way of, okay, for this time, I am going to assume some amount of authority and be the teacher and mm-hmm. tell and instruct, but I couldn't take on any airs. <laughs> Cause he'd call you on it. Like, he knew me. He knew me. He like, we smoked bong load together. You know what I mean? Like, he, didn't, <laughs> he couldn't, you know what I mean? I couldn't pretend to be some all like pure yoga guy with him, you know? <laughs> So I had to find a way to be a teacher, but still like be me with my buddy. Yeah. And I think that that was a really formative thing that I've taken with me over the years as I then started to teach groups. I just try to have that same voice that I cultivated (laughs) then. So I often think teaching your friends and your family one-to-one, I taught one-to-one for like a good year and a half before I ever taught a group class. And I think that helped me a lot. I think if you do feel like you've gotten somewhere with what you're doing as a teacher and you feel like people are getting something from it and you know what you're teaching and why you're teaching it, then I don't think it's necessarily a bad idea to start doing some kind of online video. I think sometimes even just shooting yourself, either doing a practice that people would practice along to or shooting yourself, teaching people, either way, sometimes that's a really interesting, cool, creative project. Like for me, I just initially wanted to document myself doing it. Like I'd never seen myself doing the practice. So I just wanted to document it. And in the doing of that, my, the, the guy who was producing it, he's like, I want to make this into a practice thing that I can use. So I think if you can look at it as like creative projects (laughs) rather than like launching your career, you know. It's a good insight that you had as well of kind of like, if you're not feeling ready, you're probably not ready. (laughs) Like (laughs) if you're kind of feeling like, yep, I know what I want to say. Like I've got something that I want to share. Then that's like a really good indicator that like, yep, time to take that next step. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm a big fan of actually having a script of like, how you cue your class. I don't think it has to be a set script and I think you should write it, but I have one and I don't have to stick to it, but I I think it's a good thing to have. And when it came time to shoot video, in fact, here's a tip for anybody listening who's Mm -hmm. actually going to do it. You want to, you want a really quick and easy way to make it happen is you record the audio first. So if you can record yourself cueing the class that you want to give, and have a really clean recording of that, then you just put it on and turn the video camera on and do it. Mm -hmm. And it's all synced up. (laughs) You (laughs) just really easy to put together after that. I actually didn't do that with our first project. We didn't have that foresight, and we just shot me doing it, and then I had to overdub to it after, which created all kinds of other layers of issues. (laughs) But if if you know what you're doing like that, like you have a clear, like you know what you want to say and you feel confident about that, then that's the time. But as you said, if you, if you don't feel confident, it's probably not, not the right time to start putting yourself out there like that yet. I think as well, like there's just that process of writing your script. You would do so much self editing before you have video that you have to edit, that it would save you a lot of time, you know, like you'd be so much more clear in what you're doing when you've kind of laid it all out verbally first. Yes. And I think it's actually a fantastic tool just in general as a teacher. It's why I think sometimes like systems like Bikram or some of these other systems where they teach people to have a set system and script are not necessarily a bad place to start because 
you know, like if I walk into a room full of people I've never met before, and let's just say on that day, I'm not doing that great. Like, let's say I don't, I don't have my A game with me on that day. You know, I'm, yeah. not, I'm not feeling so focused or great the way I would want to. Having like a script, I can just focus in on the words and the tone of my voice and actually bring myself to more of the place I need to be mm. through the speaking of it. And it's just like something you have in your back pocket that you can walk into any situation with and have. Now, I think where it goes wrong is when you're not allowed to go off of it. Yeah. <laughs> when it's like a thing that you have to stick to. Like, I encourage people to have a script, but I encourage them to go off of it whenever inspired. You know, like you never, you don't have to ever stick to it if you don't want to. But having it, it does provide, I think, kind of like a bit of like a ground to stand on sometimes. A good sort of framework just to sit on. And maybe kind of gives mm-hmm. you the headspace to be present for the people in the class mm-hmm. rather than just like all wrapped up in your own head trying to work out what you're going to do next. Mm-hmm. Exactly, which goes back to my point, like by giving myself some structures and giving myself permission, you know, the biggest criticism I've got over the years is people are like, Jay does the same thing every time. He even says the same stuff every time. <laughs> <laughs> and it's those people who practice with me for a long time come to discover that that's not true. Like I do say the same things a lot, but there are often things that I'm saying that I haven't said before, or new things. And what I found is that comes from my own personal practice as well. Like having a simple thing that I do every day when it's not about being able to do new poses or doing a pose more or uh, pushing my body as far as I can, it automatically becomes about other things. And, and it became for me about observing like my patterns and how I am and how what I do affects that, including what, what I eat and who I hang out with you know? mm-hmm. <laughs> and kind of getting to know myself and find how I want to be, which is what I said at the very beginning, which is what I needed to do is find the way for me to live. And in doing so, honestly, like really healed that initial wound finding a way to be and caring about myself also painted was a a lens through which to see my mom's death where it was no longer like this horrible tragedy done on me, but really in certain ways, a kind of blessing that I think brought me to a more fulfilled life. So I'm kind of grateful for it in a strange way. And I attribute that to this process that you're pointing to of, coming to know myself and my patterns and make choices for myself that are nurturing and caring. I think as well, still on the like, have a script, do the same practice or change it up. I'm actually completely the opposite as a teacher and I like rarely have an idea, but my most favourite part is kind of being present and seeing what flows and I guess it's like, what inspires my creative side and I think Mm -hmm. that can be a bit of a trap because if it's all about what's most fun for you as a teacher it can kind of slide into the performance rather than engagement model and I think a lot of teachers change up their classes because they're getting bored personally and they don't want to do the same thing every class so it can be a really good reminder just to kind of go how much of this is about you and how much of this is about what's actually serving the people in your class. Yeah. And I, I I would add to that, that I think sometimes this is a matter of personal taste. Like when I go out to dinner with my wife, I always get the same thing. She says, aren't you guys different? And I go, no, (laughs) I like this. I know what I did. So I think I have plenty of friends and teachers who don't do it like me, who are more like you and like to be more in that, um, kind of improvisation moment, which I can think can be really fruitful and thriving. I like what you said, though. It is a, a careful place to be to, to make that improvisatory moment more about them than you. Mm. That could be a challenge. It's interesting as well how often um, you will have said what feels like to you the same thing every class, 
And then, I don't know, like six months in, someone will say, oh, that thing that you said today really runs through <laughs> for me. It's like, I feel like I say that every time I teach you. So I know, it's like, it takes the penny a while to drop sometimes. <laughs> it really does. I've had that experience many times myself where someone will come up and they'll say, you said this thing in class today. Thank you so much. And I know I've said that to them at least 20 times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know I've said it to them at least 20 times. But for some reason, they heard it today. You never know. You're right. You said it, the penny drops. <laughs> I know you're coming over to Australia and New Zealand soon. Would you like to talk about that briefly? Yeah, I'm super excited about it. I mean, it's funny. I'm going to be honest with you. Like you reached out to me about doing this podcast and I thought, oh yeah, that's a good idea. I'll do a podcast like in Australia and I'll like try to help get people go to the workshops I'm going to do there at the end of the year. But I just got word like I think most of them are sold out already, which is crazy. Oh, nice. Yeah, nice. It's crazy. I, I got to be honest. I don't sell out places usually. So I didn't, had no idea I had a, any kind of following in Australia. But really, honestly, it, I have to give special thanks to Donna Fari, who I only met through coming on the podcast. But we kind of, oh, we hit it off a little bit. And then she was super cool to me, like, it's one of those moments where somebody who I always thought of Donna as kind of like one of those yoga unicorns, I call them, like mm-hmm. one of those teachers like I really respect and I've never met, you know. And she was so friendly and giving and like even just, you know, emailed me and like, I'll, I'll, I don't know if I should tell you this, but I don't think she would mind. Like she actually sent me like the copy of the contract that she uses because she knew that I was going to be closing my center and like going out on the touring circuit. I wanted to make sure I didn't get taken advantage of. Oh, that's so nice. Just, yeah, just like super cool, you know, <laughs> like, so thank you. And, and we've always been talking about <clears throat> wanting to get together and we almost made it happen at one point when we were going to be in the same place on the planet and then it didn't. And then finally she said, look, I want to hang out with you. So can we schedule some workshops for you in New Zealand? Oh, nice. (laughs) So she totally arranged it with some people she knew there, and I'm going to stay with her and teach works up in New Zealand. And then since I was going to be there, she turned me on to the guy from Key Yoga in Australia, who actually now he's going to book me. I'm going to do a just Australia tour in 2019. So I am going to come back again. Um, but I'm excited. I've never been there to that part of the world. And it's like, it's definitely been on my bucket list for a long time. So I'm, I'm really excited. And also I should mention, there's this New Zealand festival, the Aura festival. I don't know how to say it, that I'm going to be at also, which is happening. So it's like a a pretty, yeah, maybe it's like a big, I don't know, festival for New Zealand yoga teachers and stuff. So I'm, I'm going to be moderating like a discussion panel there. And I'm just excited. I've never been to that part of the world and very cool. Yeah, awesome. I guess our final question, if if you could distill all your teachings, everything you've learned and everything you like to share with everyone in the world down to one core essence, what, what do you think that thing would be? Wow, that's a doozy, huh? <laughs> yeah, we just like to finish it on an easy note. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess... I would answer this question differently depending on who I was talking to. Like if I'm talking to a bunch of yoga teachers, I would answer it one way. But if I was talking to some like not career yoga people, I would answer it another. Which what, which version would you want? How about your mate who came to your class and made you keep it real? Oh, that's good. You're, <laughs> that was good. That was real good. Um, I would say to my friend Noah, who he knows this now because he's, He's followed me and he knows what I do, but I would say that the essence of it is that we are entirely whole perfect beings as we are, that we were, we were once a conglomeration of cells. Now we're these complex thinking, feeling things, having a life with sparkling eyes and growing hair. And it is a profound wonder. It is so profound. I can't even fully comprehend it, but I do not need to be liberated from it. I do not need to be realized into it. And I do not need to be enlightened out of it. I am an entirely whole being as I am with all of my pain and difficulties. And with that, I can just relax into my life and enjoy it. 
Oh, that's beautiful. Nice. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Love it. Love it. <laughs> that's as best I can do. At, that was amazing. Uh, early Saturday morning for you. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, thanks again. Thank you so much for speaking with us. We really, really appreciate it. And it's wonderful to have the chance to talk to you. So, yeah, thanks. And also, thank you for... Um, I listen to your podcast quite a lot when mm. I'm on the tram, on my way to go teach classes. And... I think it's like a subtle part of my warm up. Like it helps me kind of get into the yoga frame of mind. So, yeah, and I'm sure you do that for thousands of people all over the world. So, thank you. Well, no, thanks back. I mean, it's always great for me to then actually get to speak to you or people who are listening or meet them when they come to workshops. I really do feel like I've got friends out there, and you guys do podcasting, so you know, like, what it's like to, like, put on a, a mic and just talk into it and it's like this meditation where when I go to hit that record button I'm just I'm just talking to my friends <laughs> so I like that um, you're out there yeah. so great. <laughs> and I'm, I'm just I'm, I appreciate you guys reaching out and bringing me on yours oh it's our pleasure <laughs> Cool. Well, I don't know. I, I don't know if I would get to see you when I'm there. I'm going to go back again in 2019. Hopefully we can like hang out and have a tea or a beer or something. I hope you enjoyed our interview with Jay. I really appreciate it. I loved his last words there. And I was also intrigued by the fact that he teaches the same structure in all of his classes. I feel he gave some really compelling reasons there. So I'm actually going to try this in at least one of my own classes. And I'm curious what you think of using the same structure in a class. I'd love to hear your feedback. You can reach out to us in our Facebook group. Just search for the Flow Artist Podcast community. Or you can find our website at podcast.flowartist.com. I would absolutely love to hear what you think. All right, next episode, we have Lorraine Rushton. Lorraine is a Sydney-based yoga teacher who specializes in teaching kids yoga. This is a really interesting topic for me as I've been teaching a community class that has participants all the way from seniors down to toddlers and infants. So I was quite excited to try and get some really good information from her on this and she definitely delivered one final thing before I leave you, I have recently started a YouTube channel, it's called No Stomach Living and it's about the experience of living without a stomach. I plan to include meditations, yoga and general tips on how to live without a stomach and we might throw in a few funny silly sketches. So again I will leave a link for that in the show notes. Alright, I hope you have a wonderful day. We will see you in a fortnight. Aroha nui. Big, big love. <laughs>